Good evening, everybody. I'm Sally Graham, and I want to welcome you to our program tonight. Thank you for joining us. Whether you're a volunteer, a donor, a corporate or nonprofit partner, a staff or a board member or a neighbor, we are grateful for your support and excited to bring you to this exclusive event. Our program will last about an hour and a half, and we'll touch on topics including the COVID-19 virus and its variants, the vaccines, when things might get back to some kind of normal and what that normal will look like. Some of you submitted questions ahead of time, so thank you for that. Um, but you may also submit questions starting now throughout the program for either Dr. Kosey or Dr. Frank using the Q&A feature at the bottom right-hand bottom of your screen. <clears throat> Sorry. Our featured speaker, Dr. Matt Kosey, is passionate about helping the public understand science and how it affects our daily lives. And this was a big subject to understand. We feel so lucky to have him with us tonight to make sense of what's been going on around us and in the world. Dr. Kosey is the brother of Emily Kosey, our office manager and so much more here at Gooshland Cares. When Emily told us about his special area of research, we knew we needed to connect with him. And then we knew we wanted to find a way to bring his expertise and experience to you. To begin our evening, I'd like to invite Emily to introduce her brother. Thanks, Sally. I'm so pleased to welcome my brother, Dr. Matthew, Dr. Matthew Cozy, as our guest speaker for the night. Matt has a BS from Virginia Tech in biology, a master's in infectious diseases from the University of Georgia, and a PhD in pathology from the University of Georgia. He now works at NC State as a tenured professor of immunology, virology, and host pathogen interactions. He's authored over 51 journal article publications, teaches classes in agrosecurity and comparative immunology, and hosts programs to engage elementary through high school age children in the field of microbiology. Since the very beginning of the pandemic, Matt's been our family's very own personal virus encyclopedia, thanks to his past research, passion for public health, and dedication to decoding the most complicated answers for the layman. I'm very excited that he's willing to share his expert knowledge with all of us tonight. So let's go ahead and get started with this presentation. I'm really excited to be here, or the facsimile for here for the past year, to talk to you about the pandemic, where we are, and where we think things might be headed over the next couple months. It's actually kind of fortuitous that we're having this event today of all days. Today is actually the one year anniversary of the WHO declaring COVID-19 as a pandemic. And just a few days later, on March 15th, 2020, Virginia would record the first of its nearly 10,000 deaths and schools quaintly were preparing for a two week hiatus. As politicians and the public were just starting to hear the alarm bells, scientists had been ringing for several weeks. That message finally started to break through a few days later when the Imperial College London put out a study forecasting how many people will get sick and die from COVID-19. They estimated there would be 2.2 million deaths in the US over eight to nine months if we continued to do nothing. That got people's attention. But the number was so big, it seemed impossible. It seemed alarmist. But it was a sober analysis based on rather simple math. The report warned that doing nothing ensured we would break our healthcare system. There'd be too many people sick all going to the hospital at the same time. There wouldn't be enough medical staff, enough beds, enough medicines or supplies. The report also looked at things we might be able to do to help slow the numbers of cases so hospitals could keep up with the sick and the dying. Converting regular rooms into new critical care spaces, closing schools, isolating cases, quarantining the most vulnerable populations. Each of these helped some, but none came close to where we needed to be to prevent the collapse of our healthcare system. So they proposed a radical idea, shutting down the economy, the whole economy, the whole world for roughly two months. And what became known as the hammer and the dance, the idea was the initial total shutdown would quickly slow down the virus spread and get cases as close to zero as possible. It would also give governments and healthcare systems around the world the time to build up testing and tracing capacity so that when things open back up, new cases could be quickly identified, isolated, and hopefully the spread of the virus managed. The report recognized 
Even this wouldn't eliminate the virus completely, but the strategy was with robust testing and tracing, additional shutdowns would be smaller, more regional, helping governments to keep things under control. That was the dance. If the 2.2 million deaths were hard for policymakers to hear, they absolutely didn't want to hear the bitter medicine the Imperial College London report called for, but it got their attention. Within days of this report, the White House started doing its daily coronavirus task force press conferences. It was at these press conferences where Dr. Bricks, Dr. Fauci, and others explained the U.S. approach, which was based on the hammer and the dance and became known as flatten the curve. They explained that starting in mid-March and through April, if we pitched a perfect game, we could keep total deaths in the United States under 240,000. And one by one, states started to enact shutdowns of varying degrees. But we never stayed locked down long enough. Or more importantly, we didn't use the time to expand testing and tracing capacity high enough to be able to keep pace with the numbers of cases. We did the lockdown part of the hammer, but not enough of the rest of it. So instead of our case counts looking like this, they look like this. This is what Virginia's numbers of daily new cases have looked like over the course of the pandemic, which is pretty similar to most other states. We did the lockdown part of the hammer, and the hospitals did the best they could to expand capacity, but we never really did the rest of it, so our numbers just kept going up. And the thing to keep in mind, the hammer and the dance were never meant to be the solution to the pandemic. There were recommendations on how to save the most number of lives and buy us time to make a vaccine. Because this thing isn't over until we have enough people who have immunity so the virus has nowhere to go and eventually dies out. Until then, people will keep getting infected and keep dying. It'll just take longer. So the vaccine is our shot to stop the dance. And scientists around the world have been working on this problem since late January 2020. According to the WHO, there are over 150 COVID-19 vaccines in development around the world. With these being the 12 that are the furthest along, and already in use in various countries, including the three currently being used in the US, and the next two we expect to be applying for emergency use authorization in the US sometime this spring or early summer. So with 150 vaccines in production, the world scientists are using every technology we know of to solve this problem. So far, we've actually been pretty lucky. Making vaccines isn't generally this easy. There are lots of diseases we've tried to make vaccines to, and several of them fail to work. So that's why so many companies are trying so many different approaches. We didn't know what would work, so we're trying everything we can think of. You can break vaccines down into four main groups. And somewhere in the world, someone is working on a vaccine based on each of these different approaches. Probably the oldest vaccine technology is the idea of finding a virus that's a milder version of the disease-causing virus. Something that doesn't really make people sick, but close enough that immunity to it will protect you from the real thing. We've used this approach to control lots of different important diseases. Smallpox, measles, mumps, rubella, and the chickenpox vaccines all use this approach. The issue here, however, is it's really hard to find a virus that's similar enough to the disease you're trying to prevent, but not so similar that it actually causes the disease. So it can take a long time to find the right strain of virus to use. There are just two COVID-19 vaccines that I'm aware of that are taking this approach but they're still in early phase one trials, which means they're a ways off from being anything you'll hear about in the news, if they even make it that far. So another well-established approach is using just proteins from the virus. We can make these by growing up large amounts of the virus and then inactivating it so it can't make you sick. Or we can use other cells to produce some of the viral proteins. In either case, there are several effective vaccines that use this approach. The flu shot, the HPV vaccine, and the shingles vaccine all use this technology. Actually, the Novavax vaccine, that so far has some good results, but is still in the middle of their phase three study and probably won't be done for another two months, they're using this approach. The disadvantage of this type of vaccine is that it's really good at stimulating your body to make antibodies against the virus, but it doesn't really do a good job of stimulating the other major antivirus cells, your T cells. That's normally okay, but if the virus mutates and your antibodies don't work anymore, you don't have your T cells to provide any protection so you'll need to develop a new vaccine. That's part of the issue with why we have to have a new flu shot each year. That's why over the past 30 years, we've been working to develop new vaccine technologies that activate all over your immune system the way the real infection would, or the way the weakened virus vaccine would, but that are faster to make. So one of these approaches is called the viral vectored vaccine. 
Here we take viruses that we know don't cause any disease in people and we engineer them to express genes from other viruses. The Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca vaccine are the two best known examples of those right now. And both use adenoviruses to deliver coronavirus immunity. This technology has been around for a long time and there are several vaccines that have been in various stages of development. Actually, Johnson & Johnson use the same virus vector for an Ebola vaccine that's been approved for use in most of the world. So then the last approach involves the use of injecting genes for some of the viral proteins in the form of either RNA or DNA. This skips the need for finding a harmless virus to put these genes in, like with the last approach, so it makes it much faster for responding to situations like this. There have been lots of clinical trials for this technology, but now the Moderna and Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines are without question the most successful of this vaccine type. The issue with these vaccines, and the reason why you haven't heard of them before, is not because they're so new or because the technology is still experimental. It's because of business and market forces, not necessarily medical or biological reasons. As you've heard on the news, these vaccines need to be kept really cold in freezers that cost around $15,000 each and only have a lifespan of around five to 10 years. If you're just talking about the shingles vaccine, no doctor or pharmacist is gonna invest in these types of freezers, not when there's other vaccines that do a good job and don't require all this special equipment. You need a special circumstance to make that make sense. A global pandemic where the government has essentially said, get it done and we'll cover the cost. Now the market forces work in your favor and you can take advantage of the speed this production approach offers. But I can't stress enough how lucky we've been with these vaccines. I mean, our understanding of how to make vaccines has gotten a lot better, but still, so far, just about every vaccine we've tried in the US, Europe, Russia, China, India, all appear to be highly effective. If you remember back to when the campaign to make vaccines started, the threshold for, of effectiveness we were hoping for was just 50%. We now have three vaccines that appear to be nearly 100% effective at preventing hospitalizations and deaths. But it's really hard to compare these vaccines head to head. Each company tested their vaccines slightly differently. And the J&J &J vaccine was tested later in the year and in different countries, so it was challenged with different viruses. The South African strain, the UK strain, the Brazil strain didn't exist, or if they did, they were only minor, or minor players in the number of infections at the time the two mRNA vaccines were being tested. I know a lot of people look at the numbers of how effective these vaccines are at preventing mild disease and think, I don't want something that's just 57% effective. Focus on the fact that all of these keep you out of the hospital, and more importantly, keep you out of the ground. But vaccines have zero effectiveness sitting on a shelf. They need to be in people's arms. For us to start putting this pandemic behind us, we need to get people vaccinated. And we actually have some good news on that front. While we've seen survey results over the past several months suggesting that at best, half of the public was planning to get vaccinated, now that the vaccines are here, and people know others who've gotten vaccinated and they didn't develop gills or grow horns, we're seeing more people planning to get the vaccine than we were even just a few months ago. However, we still have work to do if we're gonna get enough people vaccinated to start to control this virus. So what are the major reasons why people might not get the vaccine? Concerns about side effects, they felt the vaccines were rushed or produced too quickly, they wanna know more about how well they work, they have general distrust of the medical system, or they don't think they need it, or they just don't get vaccines in general of any kind. Let's go through each of these some. First, regarding side effects. I'm not gonna go into stats about how many people are experiencing sore arms or developing fevers after they got their shots. I'm not that kind of doctor, so it's probably best to leave those questions for Dr. Franks. But I can go into some more of the outlandish myths about side effects. The first one, that you can actually get COVID-19 from vaccine. I've seen reports that as many as one in three people believe this. Since we just went over the different vaccine technologies, you now know there's no live COVID-19 in any of these vaccines. So there's no way you can get COVID-19 from the vaccine. I think some people may be confusing the fact that some people experience a short fever, maybe some mild to moderate flu-like symptoms after getting the vaccine, but that's your immune system reacting to the vaccine, doing its job, not COVID-19. Another big one I hear is this rumor going around Facebook and social media 
saying that the vaccine will cause miscarriages or fertility issues because the protein that the vaccine targets has four amino acids in a row in common with a protein that plays a role in placental development. That's not true. First, if it was, everyone who got COVID-19 would have fertility issues since the protein the vaccine targets is part of the coronavirus. Second, the immune system needs between eight and 16 amino acids to recognize something. So four is just too short. And third, actually, when I first heard this rumor, my initial response was only four? That's pretty low. Proteins are made up of amino acids. There are 21 amino acids in humans. Given that all the proteins across all your cells are all made up of different combinations of just 21 different building blocks, there are bound to be lots of short regions where the same amino acid, three or four runs, show up linked together. So there's bound to be some short string of similarities between any two proteins just by chance. So going back to the list of reasons why people don't get the vaccine, the next one is the concern that these vaccines were rushed. When all you heard from March to November was it normally takes a decade to make vaccines, when they named the program Operation Warp Speed, and then we have a vaccine in nine months, this is an entirely unreasonable concern for people to have. But let me try to explain why this shouldn't worry you. It normally takes years, maybe even a decade or more, to bring a vaccine to market because making vaccines is expensive and biotech companies move very methodically to make sure they will recoup all of their development costs later. So at each stage of the process, there are lengthy discussions about progress, the strength of the data, if the project's on budget, if it's on time, has the market changed, what's it going to cost for the next phase of development, and where, where's that money gonna come from? When you get into clinical trials, the FDA is generally slower as well. And companies are risk adverse. So they're not going to invest in building the manufacturing capacity or hiring new staff to start producing millions of doses of a new product until they know they have approval. What Operation Warp Speed did was give companies money to start building manufacturing capacity. It also gave them money and the permission to run some of the clinical trials at the same time. We didn't cut steps out. We figured out ways to do things at the same time instead of one after the other. But still, this perception that things happen too fast certainly wasn't helping with groups that just have general, and in many cases well-deserved, distrust of the medical establishment. But there's good news here too. Outreach seems to be working, especially to African-American communities. You can see a major uptick in the number of people saying they plan to get the vaccine starting December all the way through now. Actually, African-Americans now have the highest level of interest in getting vaccinated, but there are still some who need convincing. We have the group that just wants to see more data about how they work, and we have the group that doesn't get vaccines or don't think they need this one. To borrow a concept from business and marketing, these people fit into what's known as the law of diffusion of innovation. Some people just don't like to be first. They need to see other people do it and not have a bad experience before they'll join in. I'm not concerned about these people. They'll come around. But it's the last group, the laggards, that we have to work on. Based on the latest surveys, the definitely won't and the probably won't groups make up about 30% of the population. We need to win over as many of these people as possible so we have the best chance of reaching herd immunity, especially since for now, the vaccine is not approved for use in kids under 16. That's a considerable amount of the population not eligible for vaccination. So we need to get as many adults to do their part to get us to herd immunity so we can protect those who can't get the vaccine. But what is herd immunity? At its most simple, it's when enough people in a population are immune to a disease such that there aren't enough new victims for the virus to spread to and an outbreak dies out before the virus has a chance to infect those who aren't vaccinated. So the herd protects the vulnerable. But what does that really mean? Let's look at a couple of simple cartoon examples. The population on the left has no immunity to COVID-19. The population on the right has 30% of the people have immunity shown in the blue figures. And then someone in each population gets infected. With a disease like COVID-19, each infected person on average infects three new people. 
So roughly a week later, that one person has infected three people, and so on, and so on, and so on. But you'll notice that the virus spreads a little slower in the population on the right. But the take home message here is that with just 30% of the population with immunity, the only people protected from the disease were those with immunity. But what if half the population had immunity? Let's compare 30% and 50%. We have our infected person introducing the virus to the two populations, and it spreads week by week to new susceptible people. And you'll notice with the higher immunity level, the virus spreads a little slower again. But just like before, only those who were vaccinated were protected. So still not herd immunity. It's hard to know exactly how many people it will take for us to achieve herd immunity, but most think it'll be above 70%. So what does that look like? The infection starts with our patient zero, but there's only one person in the population in close contact to patient zero who isn't already immune and no susceptible people in close contact to that second person. So there's nowhere for the virus to go and the outbreak flames out. So about 25% of the population who weren't vaccinated were still protected from the virus. There are always people in the population who can't get a vaccine for any number of reasons. Babies and little kids, cancer patients, organ transplant patients, immunocompromised. Herd immunity helps us make sure we can protect them too. That's why vaccines are one of the greatest inventions of all human history. But you've likely heard a lot of people saying, we don't need vaccines to get herd immunity. And on paper, that makes intuitive sense. Those that survive infection should have immunity. And so if enough people get sick and recover, at some point, we should end up with enough immunity that protects others. But one, that approach condemns a lot of people to death. Two, that's not really how things work. There are lots of diseases we've successfully controlled or even eradicated using vaccines. Smallpox, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, tetanus, whooping cough, hep A, hep B, and so on and so on. But I really can't think of a single disease we've controlled from natural herd immunity. Bieber fever, maybe. The thing is, if herd immunity happened naturally, viruses would bring about their own extinction. That's not how nature works. That's not how natural selection works. Viruses spread at a rate and mutate at a rate so that there's always enough victims. And that's the other thing herd immunity will help protect us from, the emergence of new variants. Every one of those infected people is another opportunity for the virus to mutate. The more infected people you have, the more variants you're gonna get, which means it's just a matter of time before one evolves that's different enough that can infect people who've already recovered or who have some level of immunity. So now that we have the vaccine, we're in a race to get enough people immunized before the virus changes so much that the vaccine doesn't work. Right now, there are three variants that we're the most concerned about. The first of these is B117. That was first recognized in the UK. This one seems to be about 50 to 80% more infectious, maybe as much as 64% more deadly, it also has the ability to evade some, but not all antibodies. So some of the monoclonal antibody therapies, like the one President Trump got, might not work against this variant. So far, all data says the vaccines do work against this variant, which is good because it's pretty much everywhere in the US right now. The next variant we're worried about is B1351, which was first discovered in South Africa. Like the UK variant, it's more infectious, probably more deadly, but unlike the UK variant, it seems to be able to infect people who've already recovered from other variants of COVID-19. The good news, while the vaccine isn't as effective against this variant as it is others, it does offer some protection. Then the last of the three variants is B1, which was first discovered in Brazil. Like the South African variant, the most troubling issue with this one is it seems to be able to infect people who've already recovered from earlier variants of COVID-19 and vaccines only provide partial immunity. However, we do have good news on the variant front, as all the companies who are working on vaccines are now working to develop strategies to help ensure protection against these variants and potential others. Whether those will be new vaccines, additional boosters of existing vaccines, or some combination, we don't know yet, but they're being worked on. So with the emergence of these variants and the several others that we're keeping an eye on, it makes it difficult to know exactly what the next several months might look like, or even a year or two. But I'm optimistic that we're on our way out of this mess. 
the best way to keep this virus from mutating and spreading is to immunize people faster than it can spread. We're doing that now, at least in the developed countries. At some point, by early summer I hope, the developed countries need to start assisting poorer countries with their vaccine programs. We're a global economy, and this is a global disease. It doesn't do us any good to control it here for a while, only let it cook and boil over somewhere else, it'll find its way here again. This won't be completely over anywhere until it's under control everywhere. But assuming we do that, and assuming none of the variants prove to be more problematic than the ones we already know about right now, I expect that by midsummer, things will start to look like they used to. Shops and restaurants will be more or less at capacity, movie theaters will be open again, travel will be, will be largely back. Some large indoor events still might be limited, but outdoor events will be back. How quickly this happens is up to us. If we open too quickly, we could be right back where we were in December or January, losing a 9-11's worth of Americans every day and numb to the staggering numbers. Keep in mind, while case numbers are falling, we still have as many daily cases as we had in November and we're still averaging about 1,700 deaths a day. Numbers are headed in the right direction, but it won't take much for them to shoot back up. I'm not saying we can't start to relax some restrictions, but we need to look at more than just daily new case numbers. These are the metrics I'm looking for. When we see these kinds of numbers, not just in one county or one state, but in neighboring states as well, and we have the systems in place to rapidly test and trace new cases, then we'll know it will be safe for schools and universities to open back up for in-person learning in the fall. And more importantly, let fans back to watch college football. But as excited as we all are to get back to the great parts of our lives we've been denied for the past year, friends and family, travel, the past year has also shined a bright light on aspects of our society that need improvement. Modernizing, more recognition, education, healthcare, who's essential and how we treat them. So as we recover from the last year, I really hope we can also each do our part to make society more resistant and more resilient to shocks like this in the future. Because as bad as this past year has been, it could have been worse. Nature has given us several warning shots over the past 20 years, and there's no reason to think there won't be more to come. But in the meantime, continue to stay safe, keep wearing your mask, washing your hands, watching your distance, and the one that doesn't get enough attention, but I think is the most important, open a window, and hopefully we'll be able to see each other unmasked at a restaurant in the not too distant future. Thank you, Dr. Cozy. That was a lot of wonderful information. If you're like I am and you're not sure you could really absorb all that in one shot, we will be sending you a copy, a link to the recording of uh, Dr. Cozy's talk. So um, not to worry. And we're really happy to have Dr. Cozy here with us live to answer some of your questions. Hi, Dr. Cozy. Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Great to be here. We really appreciate you being here with us. We had um, several questions that people had submitted ahead of time. Um, the first one is from Wendy. She says, I was part I was part of the AstraZeneca phase three trial. I'm positive for antibodies. When available to me, should I get a messenger vaccine? If so, do you re recommend one shot or two? So that's a great question. And I've <clears throat> been asked that before. I, I, I'll, I'll apologize in advance. I don't have a good answer. Um, the, <clears throat> I guess the first thing would always be decisions like that ultimately need to be between you and your doctor. Um, so I, I don't want to uh, sort of step outside of my lane too far, but for the most part, if you've got antibodies, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine, the data that we saw back last fall, early winter looked really promising. And it looked like it was just as effective or nearly as effective as the vaccines we've got now why we haven't seen more data from them since then is, is, is curious. Um, if you know you're antibody positive, I would probably wait and see how case numbers continue and let others use that vaccine and tell everybody who's got a vaccine, who wants a vaccine. Um, and then there'll probably be plenty 
opportunity to get a second booster shot at a probably Mayish. Um, if you were antibody negative, I'd probably have a different answer. But since you know you're antibody positive, um, I think waiting and seeing uh, <clears throat> how things unfold. If case numbers start to shoot back up, if new variants start to come out, and, or data comes out from AstraZeneca that suggests it's not as effective as the others, then I would almost certainly uh, try and find uh, either the J and J or one of the two mRNA vaccines. Should you get one shot or two? Um, haven't already gotten the AstraZeneca vaccine. Probably don't need both shots. Um, but again, depend on on what kind of other variants or how case numbers may change, uh, that answer may change. I know that's a that's a crappy answer, but that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. Another question is from Susan. She says, would you have any added concerns for a former cancer patient? Her treatments were completed about a year and a half ago, getting either type of vaccine. Uh, so another great question. And Congratulations on uh, completing the, your cancer treatment and and uh, and, and survival. Um, it's, it's a, I guess the short answer is I don't have any concerns whatsoever. Um, I've got a, a couple of friends and colleagues who uh, recently uh, different types of cancer recently completed the, their cancer th th therapies as well, and they've been vaccinated with no issues. I have seen just recently uh, a. a I haven't actually seen the whole study, but a report about a study looking at act, people who are actively undergoing cancer therapy right now that suggest um, the vaccine works in them as well, but they actually do need both shots. This was done in the UK where the UK has decided they're going to try and stretch the time between the first shot and the second shot. And so they looked at cancer patients and it looked like the cancer patients don't need to be waiting. And if anything, they need to go, they need to go sooner. But yeah, if I, I would, I would absolutely, uh, uh, get the vaccine to to have you know gone through what you went through uh, a year and a half ago. There's there's uh, no reason to take the chance. Thank you. This question is from Jimmy um, regarding the idea of pooling. Given that there's a little bit of vaccine left in every vial after administering shots, I've heard that some, but not all, vaccines you can pull the vaccine left behind in nearly empty vials to combine and make extra doses. Are any of the two dose vaccines good candidates for pooling? So uh, again, I don't I don't know the details on exactly which how they're packaged and which uh, whether Pfizer or Moderna has how much liquid left in the bottle when they're done. Um, I, I would say certainly if there's you know ten to twenty percent of a of a of a dose left in the bottom of a vial, it's worth the to dig out, uh, you know, and pool four or five bottles together to get one more shot out of it. Um, at one point, I, I believe it was the Pfizer vaccine. Um, the way they were selling that with needles, there were needles that were more wasteful and actually had more headspace. You had to sort of pull it more liquid in, into the syringe in order to get the whole shot into somebody. And that left a little bit behind. And a couple of enterprising vaccine clinics figured out that you could use different needles that actually save some of that and so they were actually able to get a whole extra dose out of each bottle. Um, once that got out, Pfizer came back and renegotiated with the with the government that said, "Oh yeah, we've been selling you uh, five dose vials. We want to now call them six dose vials." Um, and they were allowed to re renegotiate, which I thought was uh, a bad plan. But <clears throat> yeah, it, if there's a way we can we can squeeze and wring more liquid out of there and put it in arms, absolutely. If it's you know just enough to wet the bottom and it's going to take somebody more time to get it out of there and the stuff because the stuff has to stay cold if it's going to take you more time to get it out of the bottle to the point where it might start to lose effectiveness but yeah it, it's uh it, i've uh, i've been really excited to see all the ingenuity all the folks at these vac vaccine clinics have come up with to try and make sure that nothing goes to waste so what is the latest information about fully vaccinated adults being able to transmit the virus? I think a lot of us so, are wondering about that now. Yeah. And, and so actually in terms of latest, I, it was a press release from Pfizer today. So I, I haven't seen actual real data, but so far the stuff that Pfizer has put out over the last several months, their press releases has been backed up by their data um, suggests that 
they've got 94% effectiveness at preventing asymptomatic infections, which means, th and, and presumably, although I don't know that the study has been done, I'm sure Moderna is working on a similar study. Um, and, and those are so close. I'd, I'll be surprised if the results aren't, aren't similar, but it looks like at least that vaccine for now, probably the other two as well are doing a really good job at keeping people from spreading this. And so, uh, and I think to some extent that might be what we're seeing as some of the numbers are somewhat inexplicably, inexplicably following faster than we might've thought they would have after end of January, maybe as we start to see more and more vaccinated people uh, walking around, that maybe they're not spreading that, or, or the concerns that they were spreading it may not have been as, as warranted as they were. Thank you. Do we know how long immunity lasts after being fully vaccinated? I, 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 don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't mean this to be sort of... Uh, <clears throat> Smart Alec, but uh, we know they last uh, at least what? How many months has it been since November? Um, the it, it looks like we were getting probably at least a year, even for folks who've recovered from from COVID. Um, that most folks seem to be getting nine months to a year of protection. That's not the limit. And so when we've been talking about how long we know people are immune, it's just because that's only how long folks have been walking around post vaccine or post disease. The assumption is based on how high the antibody levels are from people who've been vaccinated and how, how long they're staying high in these clinical trials, that it's probably going to be immunity for at least a year, maybe longer. Um, but we need to since you probably wait a whole calendar year and see how people's antibody levels change to be, have a better gauge on how many years that might actually last. But these, and the really good news, I think for a lot of these vaccines is uh, that they're in a sort of a special class of vaccines that uh, sometimes get called superhuman because a, a lot of vaccines do a good job, but they only get you about as much immunity as the infection would. These vaccines actually seem to give you more immunity than recovering mm -hmm. from the disease does. So that's sort of why they call them superhuman. It's better than the, the, the human response would be on its own. Oh, that's good news. That's great. Um, this question is from Jimmy, um, referring to an article in The Atlantic. Could you comment on the idea of hygiene theater? For instance, going through the motions of mitigation without really putting the measures into place that are really effective, like many businesses have <clears throat> been accused of this, um, not being diligent about employees wearing masks, <clears throat> yet maybe spending lots of extra money on cleaning services that really aren't high transmission points. Yeah. And, and so I, I've, I, I think I've seen the article that, that, that he's referring to. Um, and, and I've, I've used that hygiene the, uh, theater as a pejorative, even at on campus uh, talking to administrators. Um, the, it's a, I think it's a real thing. I think there are a mix of reasons why it's happening. Uh, and certainly at the beginning, um, you know, we don't like, humans don't like uncertainty of any kind and you don't like the sense of not being in control. And so I think some of the hygiene theater comes from a sense of just wanting to feel like you're doing something to push back. There are some companies that are going through it and doing it and saying, oh yeah, yeah, well, you know, we wipe everything down every hour. So, you know, please let my restaurant open. Um, and there are others that are doing it, but just sort of out of, you know, a sense of hopelessness and not knowing exactly what to do. And so, you know, the temperature checks that at the beginning we, you know, they made sense because we still didn't know enough about how this thing spread. But then later as we figured out that most people are spreading it before they feel bad. So the temperature checks probably aren't doing that much anyways, but people still kept doing it because it, it made you feel like you were doing something. Um, and some of it's just been bad messaging, I think from, scientific community and the public health community of all getting on the same page and stressing, you know, what things actually the, the most important thing for folks to be doing. And, and I do know some folks, you know, restaurants and grocery stores and such that are spending tons of money on cleaning products and stuff that they think is probably hygiene theater too, but they're also doing it and they're doing other things and they're trying to get, these companies are trying to keep their uh, employees wearing masks and their, their customers wearing masks, but they're still sinking money into stuff that they don't think is really working. But at the same time, their attitude is, 
I would hate it if somebody who came to my establishment got sick. I got to do whether it works or not. I got to, I got, I'll feel better knowing I tried. Um, and so, uh, but to Jimmy's point, you know, if we spend too much time on the things that just make us feel better and not focus on the things that are actually going to do a better job of preventing the infection, like wearing a mask, like proper ventilation and open windows or using filter, uh, you know, HVAC systems that circulate the air more frequently and, and things of that nature. Um, the, the, but yeah, the, and, and schools watching different plans for, for opening school. And this is sort of where it came up on, on, on our campus of, well, you know, six feet isn't, there's nothing magical about six feet. Um, the virus doesn't immediately just sort of fall out of the air at six feet. Um, six feet is just sort of where it's, you start to get less spray from the person next to you talking. Um, <clears throat> and so, but schools are like, well, we don't have the space to, to separate people by six feet. So we're going to do three feet. Eh, well, that's not really, that's, that's just it's doing that to make you feel like you did something. Um, so, but yeah, no, it's, it's, <clears throat> it, it's an important topic. And, and hopefully as we've gotten smarter about this and now as vaccines are coming out, <clears throat> we'll be able to dial back on some of these things that were more feel good measures and focus more on the stuff that's actually working. So this is a question that's not going to come up at the bottom of the screen, but it builds on the, what you just talked about a little bit for businesses who are going back in place, people are going back to their offices or even those of us who have been in our offices. Um, what do you think about temperature checks? Are they effective at all? <clears throat> so I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, the places that are doing them sort of as more or less their only check is uh, it. Well, and, I, and I'll say this, and it depends on what type of establishment you are. If you are a restaurant or a bar or someplace where uh, sick people don't normally go versus a pharmacy where, or a place where folks who have medical issues might show up and you may have a more high higher likelihood that somebody with a fever or whatever else who might have COVID might show up there versus a different establishment. Some places that makes more sense than others. <clears throat> I talking to friends uh, who are seeing patients. Um, you know, I, I think the last time I, one told me that out of the last six to eight months, she'd only seen th maybe one third of the COVID positive patients she saw had a fever. Um, so, but that was different than when she was seeing patients earlier on. And so things have changed and she wasn't sure if that was the population who was getting infected or how they were pre-screening people. Cause at the very early, you, you couldn't even go to the hospital unless you had a fever. And so, um, you know, how much of it is how we were looking at things before versus now, <clears throat> but it, I, I don't think they're useless. I think the, the temperature checks play a role, but it's all these things were, you know, None of them were were uh, bulletproof vest. At best, they were just different screen doors, and we were trying to line up the holes in the screen door just right to plug up all the holes. And so, if you get all those different things that, that each one catches a few people as they get through all four or five layers of these different uh, mitigation factors, hopefully, nobody or very few people make it to the other side. Thank you. Thanks. So, this uh, question is also from Jimmy, referring to the same article in the Atlantic. When the polio vaccine was declared safe and effective, people literally danced in the streets. So this is maybe uh, when we had the COVID vaccine, which has been very effective. Um, there's been some celebration, but there's been also a lot of hesitation. People, you know, uh, the media focuses on the negative. You still have to wear a mask. You still have to socially uh, distance. You could still infect other people. Um, so just curious, why do you think we look at things so differently today? I I I, I love that question. Um, I, I have no idea. Uh, I wanted to dance in the streets. The <laughs> the and, and and you know and thinking about friends and colleagues who are, you know work in labs and completely uprooted everything they were doing, and no one sort of globally the way people were collaborating to get this done in record time. N not to take anything away from Jonas Salk and the the polio folks. But we got this done in a whole lot faster. And this, I mean, this was, in many ways, this was D-Day times going to the moon in terms of the, the amount of people who were involved, the amount of technology, the amount of money. 
the, the sort of the human undertaking and, and a one little sort of nerdy factoid, if you take all of the little, little tiny RNA strands that are inside the Pfizer vaccine and you line them up end to end for, for what would take to just the Pfizer vaccine to vaccinate everybody on planet earth, you can make it to Alpha Centauri and back seven times. So 34 light years worth of little RNA will be manufactured over the next year. And so ridiculously huge human accomplishment and why, yeah, why we spend more time talking about, yeah, but now we have variants. So what are we going to do? Um, I, I think a lot of it, and I don't, I mean, I know it's sort of cliche now to blame social media and everything else. I, we've, you know, negative emotions sort of get more traction on social media and on the media at large and feel good stories just don't bubble to the top folks. You know, we've been conditioned to have this sort of certainly over the last year, sort of be on this, this constant uh, adrenaline high of, of fear and panic of what's going to happen next. And I think some of it just sort of feeds into that of, well, we'll get more eyeballs or we'll get more clicks or more links. If we talk about how the sky is still falling as opposed to uh, the clouds might actually be parting. But yeah, Thank no, I, I I appreciate Jimmy pointing out the fact that uh, more folks need to dance in the streets over this. <laughs> <laughs> How do you explain people being right next to another person who has it, but they don't get it? <sighs> I, I I don't. Um, well, and I, I guess two things. One, so there's a concept in um, infectious diseases. Not all of them follow this rule, but COVID seems to be following this rule uh, pretty closely. It's this, they call it the 80-20 rule, where 80% of your new cases come from 20% of your current cases. That actually most of the people who are infected, we talk about, and even in the, the diagram or the, the cartoon that I use, that on average, one person infects three people. But for the most part, most infected people aren't really infecting that many other people, but we'll, we'll have these sort of super spreaders where in a population, and sometimes it's the person, sometimes, and probably more often it's the circumstances, you know, were they, you know, were they on a bus? Were they, you know, sort of trapped with people for, for, for a long period of time, all breathing the same air? Were they, uh, you know, the choir that, uh, <clears throat> outbreak that happened in, in Washington, the early part of, of, or what maybe, probably around late March uh, last year that were 15 people got infected. Um, and some folks, since this is sort of aerosol and respiratory, um, <clears throat> some folks just are better projectors. And we've even seen this with flu. And I, and I, and I <clears throat> when I talk to little kids about, about flu, there's a great uh, uh, Mythbusters episode where they actually track how far a sneeze will go. And I think some of it comes down to for this virus, it seems it's more the fine particles that hang in the air that you breathe in and get deep down in your lungs. <clears throat> We're better at infecting people than the big droplets. And both are doing it. But at the same time, if you're close to somebody who's coughing and hacking and whatever else, <clears throat> you, you turn, you pick up your, your you know, shirt or whatever else, you're sort of protecting yourself. Or if they sneeze and you actually feel wet, you go to the, you know, immediately go to the bathroom and wash yourself off. If you're on the other side of the room, 50 feet away, you don't otherwise really think or expect that that cough or that sneeze is going to waft in the air and float all the way across the room. And so the folks who are further away don't know they were infected or don't know they were exposed even. And so they don't go and wash their hands right away or they don't do anything to try and protect themselves. And so the, the, some of that may just be, if you don't know you've been exposed, you don't do anything to minimize you getting sick. Um, and at least in South, uh, South Korea and some of the other countries where they've, they've done a much better job at being able to track more trait or trace more cases than, than we have. It's been really interesting to watch some of the data come out of certain restaurants where they can actually map the infected person and all the people in the restaurant who got sick, and some of them weren't at the table with the sick person. They were at a table on the other side of the restaurant because the sick person was under the air conditioning vent that was blowing air in a way that the current was going away from their table mates and taking it off and then bouncing off a wall and catching it. And then so the person who was in the drop zone on the other side of the, the room, they're the one who got sick. And so, you know, this 
this outbreak has forced biologists and industrial engineers to talk to each other at a level that's never happened before to understand. We need to understand air currents better. They need to understand you know, some of the biological aspects of, of why uh, viruses survive where they survive. And some of the collaborations that have come out of the last year of trying to figure this stuff out have been really cool to sort of see. Thank you. Uh, this is from um, Dave. Are specific ethnic groups at higher risk of hospitalization and death from COVID after infection? I, so uh, in pretty much the US, the UK, and most of Europe, African American, Asian American, and South American folks of you know folks of color are getting hospitalized and have higher death rates than uh, white Americans or white Europeans. Exactly, there's lots of theories and, and rationales and reasons for why that is. Some of it's uh, uh, sort of poor comorbidities to begin with, poor uh, uh, living conditions and working conditions. And so their immune systems and overall health status may be lower to begin with, um, the, the, which is probably 90% of it. Because even within, uh, I think in the UK, even amongst medical staff and doctors, most of the folks who got, most of the folks who were sick and dying in the hospital among medical staff were from South Asia. Uh, Indian and Pakistani and such. And so uh, th there is a, a higher risk for hospitalization and death. Exactly why that is, is still not clear. And it'll probably be a decade before we have a good handle on what that is. Thank you. Last question from Colleen. Is the way a person reacts to the vaccine, like the side effects, similar to the way they would react if they actually were infected with the virus? So that's a great question, at least the, the, the way I think um, I, I'm hearing that, because it, it's, I think I've been wondering the same thing in terms of, you know, if you, if you're somebody who has a more severe reaction to the vaccine, would you have been somebody who ended up in the hospital or, or, or worse? Um, I, I don't know that we know that. I don't know that we'll ever necessarily know that. Um, cause there's really no way to do that experiment to, to, you can't do it twice and, you know, give somebody COVID and then give them the vaccines, see, see how they turned out. My guess is probably, and, and, and my, I, cause I've also wondered in terms of, uh, for the people who've been vaccinated and then either got asymptomatic infection or got a mild infection or got a more, didn't go to the hospital, but had a more severe infection did the vaccine just sort of turn down the knob on what their COVID infection would have been? That the person with the moderate infection post-vaccination would have been in the hospital, but the person with the moderate uh, or the mild infection would have been moderate, the person with the, you know, so on, so it's sort of step down, step down. Um, I don't know, it makes a lot of sense, um, but uh, it, it's something to theorize, but I don't know, we, we don't, we'll ever know for sure. But, but clearly, uh, just, I don't think this is the question, but I just wanna make sure, um, the side effect of the vaccine and the reaction of the vaccine is not what you would have had with COVID. So it's not like you, the vaccine is going to kill you. Right, right. So I guess if you have a severe reaction, you ought to be especially happy that you had the vaccine because you really would have been in trouble if you got the infection. Well, and, and what's really interesting is there a pattern has been developing, at least with the folks who get the, the, the mRNA shots or the, the, the two doses. If you had COVID, you have a more severe reaction to the first shot and almost in a relatively mild reaction to the second shot. If you haven't had COVID, you, you have your more severe reaction to the second shot. And so it's, it's as if the immune system sees it the first time, not, not so, well, with, at least with the vaccine, pays some attention to it, builds up a, uh, some, some immunity, but isn't really paying that much attention. It sees it again and it comes back and is like, no, 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 we already, I dealt with you once and it drops a hammer. And just like, you know, if you saw COVID before and then you see the vaccine, the immune system's like, we already did with this. And so it, it breaks out the big guns. And then by then it's got so many antibodies when the second shot comes around, you barely even notice it, which for the most part tells you if you saw COVID again, you'd barely even notice it. Thank you, Dr. Cozy. Thank you so much. This was super informative and we were so grateful for your time. 
Thank you. And uh, but no, as no, I said, <laughs> go ahead. No, no it, my, my absolute pleasure. Well, as I said before, you will send out the recording because there's been a lot of great information that I know we all want to probably watch the second time to absorb it all. So thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Tom Frank. Dr. Frank is the uh, health director for the Chickahominy Health District. Hi, Dr. Frank. He um, received his, um, he's been with the health, health district um, in our area for 13 years. He received his uh, MD from the University of Virginia School of Medicine and his master's in public health from VCU. He um, has worked in the fields of emergency medicine, family medicine, sports medicine, and most recently public health. He also served as a flight surgeon and retired after 29 years in the Navy. So um, his most, in my opinion, his most remarkable uh, career achievement was he was involved in helping start our free clinic. So welcome Dr. Uh, Dr. Frank. He'll give us a quick update um, to our area specifically, Goochland and surrounding areas. Um, and um, then we've got some questions submitted by the audience. Hi, Sam. Dr. Hey. Okay, let me know if you uh, cannot hear me uh, loud and clear, and I'll, I'll try to adjust things here. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. This is a great opportunity, I think, for all of us to just share uh, information back and forth and ask questions and hopefully have some good answers. So I really appreciate it. Um, uh, just a, a quick update, and then, uh, then you all can ask questions. Um, I just wanted to let you know, um, as everybody knows, you've seen it on the news that the number of cases are going down uh, throughout the United States and in Virginia. There may be a little bit of an uptick um, in Virginia just recently, and there's a little bit of an uptick around the world right now. And um, there may be a number of different reasons for that, uh, but there are some new variants going around. Uh, but, but the really good news that I wanted to share tonight is the fact that in Virginia, uh, 2,493,097 people have uh, wow. have received uh, some form of a dose of vaccine. And of, of those, um, there's 1.6 million people have, re have received at least one dose of vaccine. And that uh, amounts to about 19% of our population in Virginia have, has received uh, one dose of vaccine, at least one dose of vaccine. And so that's really, really good news. And what's even better for Goochland and, uh, and I'm happy to share this tonight, that as of today in Goochland, 9,527 doses of vaccine have been given out mm -hmm. and 6,179 Goochlanders have received at least one dose of vaccine, uh, which is just truly remarkable given the fact that this vaccine just came out you know, a couple of months ago. And so in Goochland, whereas in Virginia, 19% of the population has received at least one dose in Goochland, over 26% of people wow. have received at least one dose as of this morning. And, and we even gave some more of this uh, today. We had a, a mass clinic today over at the uh, Central High. So we Dr. Got Frank, I'm gonna interrupt and just say that's a tribute to your team's efforts because I know you all have been working 80 hours a week to get this vaccine out, so thank you. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but it, it's definitely worth it. It's so motivating and encouraging to see people's faces as they leave that vaccine clinic and a big smile on their face and, and gratitude and everything else is so uplifting. It, it's really what keeps us going. Um, and what drives us is, is this whole vaccination process and watching people's faces as they leave. So it's truly remarkable. Um, but you know, our job's not over yet. We, we want to keep vaccinating and we want to keep going until our goal is really to get 75% of the population vaccinated. And, and we hope to do that, um, you know, by, by the, at least by June, uh, we think we might even be able to do it by the end of May. Um, the original goal was to get it done by the end of June and uh, listening to President Biden and uh, Governor Northam and Danny Abula, it's looking like we might even be able to get this done by the end of May. We'll see. We'll have to see how these uh, supplies of vaccine come. Uh, but I'm just really happy to share that. Um, and I'll get a, a little bit more detail if I have a couple more minutes. Uh, looking at the vaccinations in Goochland, specifically in Goochland, if you look at the 80-year-olds and older, people older than 80, 
about uh, 61 percent of them have been vaccinated. Uh, if you look at the, the decade of 70 to 79, people age 70 to 79, uh, over 65 percent of them have been vaccinated, all, which is incredible. And then 60 to 69 year olds, about 41, just over 41 percent have been vaccinated. And, and now we're kind of working on that. Uh, we're working on getting younger and younger people into the clinics. So we, we've been focusing on 75 years and older and then 65 and older. And now we're going to be focusing on uh, on people age 16 to 64 with underlying medical conditions and get those folks in, as well as our frontline essential workers at the same time. So that's really uh, that's kind of our current goal, our current strategy uh, when it comes to vaccinating right now. Um, so uh, at that, I'll just kind of leave it there. Uh, we, we've got a lot of people working on COVID response. We're still, um, you know, public health still goes on. We still get reportable diseases every single day. We still get salmonella and, and restaurant outbreaks and legionella and uh, meningitis cases that we have to s stop from spreading. So these things are still going on every single day. And we're still fighting COVID outbreaks in, in facilities and, and in the community. And we're still case investigating and contact tracing. And now we've got all this vaccinating going on. So we do have a cadre uh, of, of at least 50 contract temp people who we've hired to help us with all of this uh, huge, this huge, huge uh, response to COVID-19. Uh, so we're, we're very fortunate to have those folks, as well as our regular public health staff uh, in the district helping out. So, and, and I'm just really grateful for all of them for stepping up and many of them working seven days a week. Uh, many of them haven't had a day off in, in months and months um, and working you know, 80 hours. We have some people working 90, 99 hours yeah. a week on a, re on a regular basis. So they're really putting in a great effort. Um, and then uh, that's all I have, but I'll be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Well, I have a, a just a sort of basic question. What would you tell people who are in the eligible uh, group as far as if they're having trouble accessing the vaccine? What would you tell them to do? Um, first of all, make sure that you're pre-registered. And, and if there's any doubt, go back in and re-register. Get yourself uh, either, either call in the uh, 1-877-VAX-NVA number or uh, get online and, and go um, go to vaccinate.virginia.gov and get your name pre-registered. Get all your information in there if you haven't already. Um, if you if you pre-registered with the health department where you live, then you're you sh you're you should be good to go. But you should also be receiving some some email feedback from the uh, pre-registration website, the pre-registration site that the state has. Um, they are giving people feedback through emails. And that's one way you know that you're you're pre-registered. You should be getting regular emails from the state registration site. So if you're not, you may want to go in there. Just go ahead and make sure you're pre-registered in there. Uh, Vaccinate.virginia spelled out .gov. Vaccinate.virginia.gov, and get yourself on that website. Um, and then in that, that, they'll have a questionnaire where you're answering uh, how old how old you are and what occupation you have, and they'll be with that. With those answers that you give on your uh, registration, um, your pre-registration survey, uh, they will be able to tell what category you're in, and then you're on the wait list, and you'll you'll be called eventually when your time comes to go get an. Uh, Thank you, and we'll have that information on the screen um, in a little bit, so um, people can see that again. Thank you. Um, so we've got a, a few questions that have been submitted. One is from Joyce. Um, it concerns undocumented people living in our area. If they're willing to get the vaccine, how will this be handled if they're undocumented? Um, earlier, some scheduling websites had questions about insurance, which many of them don't have. Uh, will there be a place they can feel safe enough to get the vaccine? Are there plans for outreach or local vaccination sites since many don't have a driver's license or transportation? Yeah, oh, that's great, great question. Um, and the answer is it doesn't matter whether you have insurance or don't have insurance. Um, this vaccine is is free, uh, and we don't we don't really care if you have insurance or not. The uh, all over the country, this vaccine is free, and it, it was supplied by the by the federal government and purchased through these companies, and it was brought to the states, and it is available to everybody, everybody who lives in any particular area in, in any state. 
you can go and get this vaccine. It doesn't matter uh, who you are or where you live or what kind of work you do. Um, once you're eligible, once your your category comes up and you're eligible to receive that vaccine, um, there there is no turning anybody away. We will give that vaccine out and it's free and it, there's no insurance is required. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, anybody's welcome to come once once they're um, eligible and they fall in that eligibility group. Uh, we will welcome anybody into one of our clinics. Is there anything in the registration process that would make them feel they're vulnerable to, I, to um, IHS, to being tracked or? I mean, there's there's always, important. you know, anytime, I think anytime anybody has an online registration form, some people feel intimidated by that. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if that's the case, uh, you can also phone, just give a phone call to um, the health department or call the one eight seven seven. 877 Vax and VA number, and you'll get to talk to a human being, and and um, they have they have a, a whole bunch of operators, 750 operators, just waiting to talk to people, and walk them through the process, um, or or call your health department, call your local health department, and we hope to uh, be, be doing a lot more outreach as well, uh, working with you know groups like uh, Goochland Cares and uh, working through uh, Department of Social Services and Senior Connects and all these other organizations. We're going to reach out to people that way as well. And instead of just waiting for them to call in, we're going to be reaching out to people out in the community. Yeah, thank you. We've had a great partnership with the health department and we're excited to be doing our own vaccine clinics yes. in conjunction with the health department. It's been very exciting. Um, this is from Gail. I received my first vaccine, Moderna, from a CVS in another state. I'm told by the health district personnel that I'm now ineligible to schedule my second vaccine through the health district, and I have to get it from CVS. How can I ensure I get my second dose within the 28 days? Yeah, and so that uh, that comes up from time to time because there are people um, who either move to a, a different state or they they happen to have uh, got access to the vaccine by crossing the border and going to another state. Um, and so while while we prefer that people come back to the same location uh, in the same entity that gave them that vaccine, the first dose, it, it's easier to track those doses if they come back to the same organization. Um, it's not required. There's, there's nothing that requires that. And we, we, um, we see lots of people from all over the state who came to our, our uh, clinics uh, and we gave them their second doses. And they, they came from Southwest Virginia and Roanoke and they came from Lexington and they came from Virginia Beach. Uh, because they knew we had a clinic, we had openings, and they came and we vaccinated them. So we're not keeping anybody away as long as they're eligible and you know they actually do need their second dose. Uh, we will bring them in. So we we would prefer that people try to stick to the same organization because it's it, that way it's easier to track the doses and it doesn't throw off the um, all these second doses that we're given. Um, it throws off the numbers if we have too many people kind of. Uh, come into our clinics when they went to CVS the first time, and now they're coming to us the second time. It throws off CVS's numbers, and it throws off our numbers when it comes to the number of second doses we're supposed to get. Um, but other than that, we're not. It, they're not ineligible at all. They, we will work them in. If they need that second dose, we want to get them that second dose. So we're not going to turn anybody down. Thank you. This question is from Jimmy. Dr. Avula has said that all adults can be vaccinated by the end of May. In Virginia, how many inoculations per day? This sounds like a math question in fourth uh, grade. How many inoculations per day would that require to be accomplished? Now, yeah, we need to hire Jimmy and uh, help us work through that. The, uh, you know, I think that, that was a pr that's a prediction. You know, these predictions that we had originally, it was uh, we think we can get through the uh, uh, the, the uh, entire adult population by the end of June was the initial one. Um, well, now it looks like the supply chain is opening up a bit. And so remember that, um, you know, early on the first, the first month or so we were, Virginia was getting about a hundred thousand doses a week. Um, you know, as this thing was getting kicked off hundred thousand doses a week, we were able to just get started. And then that picked up to uh, over 200,000 doses a week. And then recently it's picked up to about 400 to 450,000 doses a week. And, um, you know, that, that's, uh, we, we've been doing about, I think we broke the 50,000 doses a day, which is what the governor, the governor's goal was originally to 
have Virginia be doing 50,000 doses administered per day. Well, we're there. We're, we've been doing about 53,000 doses a day for the last week or so. Um, we even we even reached uh, 70,000 doses a week uh, last week when there was a big surge, um, uh, a big surge of vaccines that came in. But right now we're at about 400 to 450,000 doses a week. And with the supply chains opening up, we're going to get up to 700. We think we're going to get up to 700,000 doses a week here uh, in the next month or so. And if that happens, uh, then we should be able to get through the adult population uh, some, by the end of May, if that were to happen. So, so I'm, I don't know for sure what's going to happen, uh, but sometime uh, either the end of May or the end of June, we should have uh, the adult population vaccinated, uh, or at least the ones who want to be vaccinated. Right now, that's only 70%. Um, we hope, we want to bring that up to at least 75%. We want at least 75% of people out there to be vaccinated who are eligible to be vaccinated. Uh, but we will have offered it to the entire population, um, I think, by the end of May or end of June. And uh, we and we hope to get 75% of people vaccinated. So this is a sort of add-on um, to that question. This is from Dave. Based on current trends, how soon might we see the vaccines open to the group 1C? And will that 1C group be further segmented as far as prioritizing? Yeah, so there's been a lot of speculation. Uh, again, that it depends on the supply of vaccine coming in um, and how quickly that bumps up from 400 to 700,000 per week in Virginia. Um, but I, we've heard different predictions. Uh, the most recent, most recently, is is by the maybe by the third week of uh, April, we will have gotten through with a one B population, the phase one B, which is what we're working on right now. So Virginia currently is in phase one A and phase one B. So those are the people who are eligible, and uh, the Richmond Metro area, which is where uh, Chickahominy Health District resides in the Richmond Metro area. We, we just opened up to all of 1B uh, this this uh, week at the beginning of the week. So we were at partial 1B and now we're at full 1B um, and we're gonna start going down that list. And uh, if the supply chain uh, opens up the way we think it is, uh, we, sh we uh, should be able to get through 1B by the end of April. And then that, that would open us up to 1C. And it will probably open up to 1C even you know before we like to overlap we, we don't, you don't want to say, hey, we've got to vaccinate every single 75 and older person before we open up to anybody else, because then our, our clinics would be uh, half full and then they would be a quarter full and we would have so many openings in that clinic. That's not the way to do it. So you want to you want there to be overlap between phase 1A and then phase 1B. And then you want some overlap between phase 1B and 1C. So it's it's more of a gradual progression than it is a all or none. Thank you. This is from Kenny. Are there people with certain blood types who are more immune to COVID-19? Um, I have no idea. That's a great <laughs> question. We bring your, uh, you need to bring your uh, previous uh, presenter on back and make an answer. I have no idea. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, research being done on that though. Um, eventually someday we'll probably have an answer to that, but I have no idea right now. And this is your final question. You're probably doing this. Um, according to the VDH website, Virginia has two weeks worth of vaccine and in inventory for second doses. Given the prospect of increased supply, less inclement weather, that kind of thing, should this be reduced to one week? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Also, we our goal, whenever we get a supply of vaccine in, uh, and every week, typically every week we get a supply in towards the beginning of the week, our goal is to administer all of that vaccine, um, administer that vaccine within seven to 10 days. Was given, that was our charge given by the state. And so that's our goal is to administer that vaccine within seven to 10 days. And the other goal is to uh, administer about at least 90% of your inventory that you get each week, try to administer 90% of it. But I, I also think it's important um, to have at least some surplus supply at the end of the week because you never know what's going to happen the following week um, for, you know, the weather was one, one example, we had that really bad weather week um, and it was, we didn't get any supply in that week. And if those districts that didn't have any supply were out of luck. They had to cancel all of their clinics, um, whether the weather was bad or not the following week, they had to cancel clinics.
but those districts that had at least a little bit of supply left were able to keep some clinics going and keep vaccinating. Um, and weather is not the only thing that could cancel, um, that could mess you up. Yeah, you could, you could have, um, uh, you could have a, a transportation accident where that vaccine got destroyed, for example, and then you're, there goes your shipment of, uh, of you know, ten thousand vaccines you were supposed to get that week, uh, because maybe uh, the delivery truck got in an accident and that vaccine is no good anymore. So you, you always have to have contingency plans uh, in my book. Um, always have. Uh, I, I like to have at least enough supply to get me through uh, at least a couple more clinics the next week, um, and because sometimes the vaccine might be delayed too by a day or two, and then if you don't have any for your Tuesday clinic, you're out of luck. So I want to make sure I always have a little bit of supply up for the next week. I thought you were a Boy Scout. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, last time you mean. So we have uh, Dr. Kosey is standing by and he's given us an answer to the question. He says, O and O negative tend to be fewer and less severe, but just barely lower. They're not resistant to it. They can still get it and still die. So uh, there's your, there's the answer to that. Um, yeah. So uh, is there anything else, uh, Dr. Frank, that you want this group to know? This is mostly people who are local. Um, anything they need to know about this whole effort, which is incredible. Yeah, I would just, uh, I would reiterate what uh, Dr. Cozy said about the, uh, just the whole fact that we have vaccine available at all is a miracle. I mean, it's just a tremendous feat um, that, that required all kinds of ingenuity and hard work and uh, science and uh, manufacturing process uh, to get a vaccine out in less than a year from when the epidemic, from the, the pandemic started in, uh, you know, in Virginia, we have a vaccine that came out in less than a year. This is truly uh, unbelievable. I never would have believed that uh, a year ago. I never would have even imagined that that could happen. And so we are just extremely fortunate to be, uh, you know, part of this, uh, th this era where we can have technology and science that can produce something like this that works so well in a, in a vaccine that's, uh, Vaccines that are 95% effective um, and and almost 100% effective at preventing hospitalizations and almost 100% effective at preventing deaths in people. That's just an incredible, incredible uh, feat of science and technology and art and hard work and ingenuity. And so uh, we, we're just extremely fortunate to be uh, you know, to be living at the time we're living right now. So we should be dancing in the street. We are, yeah. I was. We, be. <laughs> we are. We were uh, dancing for joy, and uh, uh, yeah, it was like the first glimmer of hope when that vaccine announcement came out. Uh, we finally started to see light at the end of the tunnel, and that light's getting bigger and bigger. Um, and we're having more and more hope and encouragement, and uh, it, it's really what keeps us going. Thank you. And I need to bring the program to a close, so I want to. Thank Dr. Frank and Dr. Cozy for their time. We know how incredibly busy you are and we really, really appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. So I just can't tell you how grateful we are. And to all of you who joined us online, thank you for your interest and your participation. Your support makes us strong and that's why Goochland Cares is able to meet the challenges of a year like 2020. And it's not over. Pain's still there, hunger's still there, homelessness is still there, the pandemic's still with us. There's a lot of uncertainty, but one thing certain is you. The Gushland Cares family wishes you and your family a healthy and happy 2021. So I wanna thank you and say good night. And as you can see the information about signing up, um, if you haven't done so already is on the screen. And um, I'm just, I wish you a happy and safe 2021. Thank you. <laughs>